Hello, everyone. I'm Jean-Claude Adion Mystic, and welcome to today's edition of Beyond the Vault. With me, of course, is Mr. Andy Sheckman. He's the president and CEO of MilesFranklin.com. Andy, welcome back to the show. How are you? JC, my brother, it's wonderful to see you again, and uh, thank you for your patience while I was gallivanting around Europe. I appreciate it. It's good to be back. I wonder what it looks like to look at, to watch an Andy Sheckman gallivanting. <laughs> you just painted an image. What of my Here's what happens when you party too hard in Amsterdam. Uh oh. Yeah. You, <laughs> you got that? it down. Okay, so palladium, argent, silver, uh, PT, platinum, and gold. Yeah. So I, I was saying earlier on a podcast I did this morning. My my wife calls my daughter. Says your dad's getting a tattoo right now. She says rad. And then she told him what it is. And she said, he's such a nerd. You know, <laughs> periodic table of elements, I don't think is exactly what she was thinking about. <laughs> you know, you should have had some tribal bar barbed wire or something to go with yeah. it. Come on, Andy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how was your trip? Did you have time? Did you took some time I had a blast, off? man. I, no. uh, I did some really cool stuff in London that I will announce, I think, next week, uh, how it impacts my business. And then we went to, and then I was there for a week, and then went to uh, Amsterdam for three nights that I hardly remember, and uh, and then four nights in uh, in Paris, which was fantastic. Wow, cool! It was Amsterdam. nice, man. It, it was nice. You know, I will say this: that um, the way that the Western media portrays what's going on there, I didn't see it. Now, granted, I wasn't really in the outskirts, or I wasn't anywhere. And the thing you know, things. off the beaten path, but it it yeah. was fantastic. Had a lovely time in all three places. I'll tell you what, though, it ain't cheap. I mean, it's not cheap. You, you go out to dinner, even at a you know just a decent place with four people and maybe one drink each, and it's you know it's three four hundred dollars. It's crazy. It's how expensive it is. Right, right, right. Well, I'm happy you had a good time, and uh, maybe for another show we can talk about what happened in Amsterdam. That that's yeah, <laughs> a whole other beer time. one night for sure. Okay, sounds good. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here today. Uh, we're going to catch up with Andy, look at the markets here, what's happening in gold and silver, and some of the news also uh, from the Fed. Uh, the S&P futures uh, fell sharply here on this new uh, print for the uh, consumer price index. Uh, people worried about that. Something seems to be broken in the back. A lot of uh, geopolitical uh, haggling about this today, too, saying that it's too close to the election. It's going to be very hard for Biden to get out from under this here. People remember that. They're feeling it, of course, uh, at the pump. They're feeling it at the, the restaurant, as you just said. And, uh, yeah, this is uh, indications here of things to come and where we're going here for the summer. Um, big news, of course, since you and I talked last. We've crossed the 26, the 27, the 28, and we're hitting – well, we actually hit 29 yesterday. This is an older poster, but uh, – Something seems to be happening in silver. We'll get into some of those charts a little bit later. This is one of them here, the cup and handle. We seem to be in this breakout. There's uh, there's people um, suggesting that this uh, particular graphic is not as important as a graphic uh, that looks at the gold to silver ratio, which is also suggesting another breakout. Maybe you and I can break that down a little bit later on. Uh, we're seeing... Um, Gold also make its same move. So it's been quite of a crazy week. There's a lot of pressure. And the continuation here of this arbitrage between uh, the East and the West, we saw $30, or I think 31 almost print also the other day uh, in Shanghai versus here on the COMEX. So that discrepancy continues to grow. Uh, and the trend is uh, positive still for, for all of us. So there's a lot going on there. Andy, you sent me a couple of news items here today. Let's start here with India. Again, hitting record highs. Explain what's happening there. Are they seeing a different writing on the wall than perhaps the North American consumers? We saw that Costco was selling crazy amounts of gold also recently. They ran out of the Silver Eagles when they went to market. So something's happening around the world, but specifically here in India. What's your take on this? Yeah, you know, look, I, it, it feels to me as though almost the COMEX is or has lost control at, or very close to losing control of whole, gold in particular, but silver won't be far behind it. Look, India imported 400 million ounces of silver in the last two years. And that's about 10 times the amount that uh, uh, is backing the bars on COMEX or backing the contracts on COMEX, the bars that are for sale, about 40 million ounces. They bought 400 million ounces in the last two years. Uh, the COMEX is, is being bled dry, as is the uh, LBMA. Last year, they imported 2,000 
uh, let's see, last year, 3,625 tons uh, last year for the entire year, which was a record year. Just in the first two months, they've imported 2,930 tons. So they're only 700 tons off of what they imported last year. It's not stopping. Um, and I think this is just, just the very, very beginning to try and hold back through naked shorting um, the price of silver is ridiculous. It's as dumb as a mud wall in a rainstorm. And um, it's, it's, it's something that is playing right into the hands of these countries that have become industrialized, become wealthy, become mm. sophisticated. And they're like, fine, you want to play this game? You want to short the price of these metals? We'll stand for delivery. And that's exactly what India is doing. And look, you know, there's a whole big faction in Canada that's behind uh, pushing uh, silver to be reclassified into not an industrial metal, but a strategic metal. Mm -hmm. And and it should be. So that's what India understands. That's what China understands. And, and these countries understand that holding, you see, what's really different right now, JC, is that uh, the, the COMEX market um, is, is, is being exploited to replace the bond market. What I mean by that is that for all these years, um, these countries would buy our U.S. treasuries. And from a historical context, it has a very small footprint accepting another country's debt as an asset. But they would accept those treasuries and buy, you know, longer duration treasuries. But who in their right mind would do that right now, would buy a longer duration treasury when we're adding a trillion dollars a quarter to to debt and a and hundred billion every three months or four months in interest payments. Um, and and if you hold those treasuries and you 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 are not aligned with the West ideologically, well, we'll just confiscate it and use it to fund the Ukrainian war. Our brain-dead idiot Treasury Secretary in Brazil, in which is a BRICS member, publicly says we need to confiscate the $380 billion in Forex reserves for the Russians and use it to fund Ukraine. I mean, if you're going to say that, maybe say it behind closed doors, not in Brazil publicly. Completely and totally idiotic. So these countries say, look, what the hell would we buy U.S. Treasuries for that if you compare the last 25 years have averaged not even close to what gold has done at 9% per year on gold, Treasuries way less than that. And they have default risk and sanction and, and confiscation risk, whereas you can buy gold, which has no counterparty risk, which has no default risk, which has been money for 5,000 years and, and is being accepted by the world, I think, as it's being remonetized across the globe in terms of trade. And so all of these, you mentioned the cup and handle and the gold to silver ratio, and others would talk about a strong dollar ratio. Others would talk about about positive rising yields, all of these things, you know, these 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 central banks don't give a crap about. They don't give a crap about a strong dollar. They don't give a crap about rising real interest rates or any of these, you know, gold to silver ratios. Knock, Minnie, knock it off. Hey, knock it off. Sorry, every time she does this. Anyways, bottom My line is probably that get a mark also. Okay. They just want the metals. That's yeah. it, and yeah. that's what you are seeing right now is massive acquisition in any single way that they possibly can well that um, was india look at just a uh, buying frenzy here in china sparks wild swings and trading halt here for gold etf so what was the frenzy about this also here in china well not only the halt. i mean yeah on monday morning silver opened up seven percent limit it halted the the price of silver on the on the futures exchange in china where bang up seven percent and triggered the the halt and here again what you are seeing is uh, is the chinese and the indians and the russians and the saudis all these countries understanding that that this is wealth mm -hmm. and they are in a frenzy 17 straight months in a row uh chinese have bought but in your backyard the bank of montreal an analyst just came out and and said that they are way in fact let me just read the actual quote he says because I think it's 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 relevant. Uh, he says that bear with me. Bank of Montreal analyst writes that its analysis suggests that privately owned gold holdings and those under the central bank in China are significantly higher than annual consumer demand and official purchases might suggest. Alistair McLeod is a guy that I really have uh, great admiration for, and he mm -hmm. talks about. Um, the Chinese having 38,000 metric tons of gold. That's his estimation. 20 held by the public and 18 by, or 20 by the state and 18 by the public. Well, 
if that's true, that's five times more than the United States holds, which supposedly has the most gold in the world at 8,300 metric tons, which hasn't been audited since 1956. So what these countries are realizing is that, look, when the COMEX market was developed in 1974 and they said, here's how we can control the price. Well, let the public buy gold because that's right when they made it legal to own it again. But if we let them own gold, we can't have it be one-to-one -one supply demand. It will will end up hurting the dollar and gold will go to the moon and, 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 and the dollar will collapse. So instead, what we'll do is we'll create levered contracts that allow us to rehypothecate three, four, five hundred times every claim because no one stands for delivery. And back then, China and Russia and India, th these countries were, you know, they certainly weren't industrialized or wealthy enough to stand up to the West. Heck, they're basically third world China and India. Now, not the case. Wealthy, industrialized, sophisticated. And so what they did back then was they'd say, well, here, we'll make a contract with great leverage that we can sell over and over and over again because no one stands for delivery. So we'll pretend that to create and deliver this gold uh, and, and the people who buy it, well, they can pretend to buy it too because all you need is money in your margin account. You don't need to pay for it. So right. if I have a million dollars in my margin account right now, I can buy a gold contract for about a $5 trade. It just, I have 10 bucks maybe for a hundred ounce contract. And it costs me nothing else than that because as long as I have at least 8,000 bucks in my margin account, I can control hundred ounces of gold, $235,000. Well, so, you know, if you're a big bank and you got 100 million in your margin account, you could control in essence 35 times that leverage if you really wanted to. So you could control, you know, well into the billions of dollars worth of paper levered contracts that no one stands for delivery. So I'll pretend to pay for it and, and you'll pretend to say I own it. But that's changing now. See, mm -hmm. now they're like, great, short it, because we're going to stand for delivery. Thank you very much. And that's what they've been doing, draining the COMEX, draining the LBMA. And as you just showed there, buddy, the arbitrage, they're turning the arbitrage up. Peter Spin on Goldseek, my good buddy who lives, uh, used to live in Canada, but now he's in, uh, where the heck is he? He's in, um, oh, I can't think of it, Prague. He, I think he's in Prague. Anyways, he... Um, he said it was 31 and change last night. I did the math and I came up closer to this number. I'm not sure how yeah. he got it. But nonetheless, you're seeing a premium. That arbitrage premium is, is for real. And you have these traders who can access the London and the COMEX market. I mean, the, yeah, the London and the COMEX and then deliver in Shanghai anything that's not nailed down. And, and, and you know, people might think, well, why don't they just turn up the price even higher? Well, they will, but they have to do it slowly enough to not cut off their nose to spite your face, their face. Right. I want you to listen to something. This is just a, an interesting deal. You know, the Chinese, we always hear they think in terms of decades. This is a comment, a statement made by Zhu Lu, Lu Do, I can't pronounce, X-U-L-U-O-D-E. I don't know how to say it, but he's the chairman of the Shanghai Gold Exchange in May of 2014. And it's just a, a, just a little statement. He says, Shanghai Gold will change the current gold market with its consumed in the East, but priced in the West arrangement. When China has the right to speak in the international gold market, the true price of gold will be revealed. And that's exactly what is happening. I want to read you one other thing, because, you know, for a long time, for four years, I've been screaming to everyone who will listen to me that the BRICS is real. I was saying it before anybody else. And I, a lot of the things that I was saying are coming true, which really freaks me out, actually not in a Nostradamus kind of way, not in a, oh, I see things that others don't kind of way, in a way that I saw it and it's happening. And it means, if, it, if it's happening as fast as I think, it means what I feel it's coming is not going to be very pleasant. So we've talked about the fact for a long time that the, the BRICS will issue a common settlement currency. And yeah. I've been saying for the last few months, it really doesn't matter that they do that because what they're doing right now, JC, is trading in local currencies. For example, China is you know, China just canceled all of a, a ton of contracts uh, for wheat with Australia and the United States, like thousands and thousands of tons of it. And they're buying it now from uh, Russia and from Brazil. But they're paying for it in yuan, which then can immediately be uh, and I'm going to come to that in a second, which okay. can immediately then be converted into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And right. so the settlement 
in yuan chips away at the dollar settlement status. He's always used to be settled in dollars. And instead of putting excess reserves into treasuries, they're putting it into gold. So which, it's like a double uh, whammy there. Yes. Now, yeah. I'm going to get uh, – you can put that up there because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to it in a moment. But – so this leads me to a statement that was just made by one of the finance ministers. Well, we can start with that because I sent you another article too. But that one in particular, look, you know, here is a statement made by one of the finance ministers in Russia. He says, look, global prices are primarily determined by the Chicago Commodity Exchange. Moscow seeks to move away from trading grain for the U.S. dollar in favor of national currencies of BRICS member states. That's what they're doing right now. The ministry insists, here's the important part, that the BRICS countries are the largest grain producers and exporters in the world, but have no leverage to influence the prices of their agricultural commodities critical for food security. So here again, they are going to change everything. They are going to make exchanges that allow for price to be set uh, to be determined by supply and demand, not by the whims of the speculative casino style Western system right. where the tail wags the dog. But what really I found interesting about everything that we've been talking about for two years is the finance minister talking about a new international currency. And we've been, this one, we, uh, that's it. We've been saying this for a very long time. We, we, what he says, we know. He came out and he said, the idea of the currency is, is two baskets, a basket of national currencies of the states involved or the countries involved, and then a basket of commodities. That's nothing new. If you've been listening to me for three years, you know that. And uh -huh. that's because Sergei Le uh, Glazdyev has been saying this is going to happen. He said it should be in a digital form. We knew that a marriage between commodities and blockchain so it can be used without the banking system, meaning no SWIFT. But here's where it gets interesting, and I want people to really hear this. He says, the second part is price. For the moment, for the moment, price is determined by Western speculation. We produce these commodities and we consume them, but we do not have our own price mechanism, which will balance supply and demand. Mm -hmm. During the COVID pa panic, the price of oil fell to nearly zero. Now we know he was wrong. That fell to negative 40 it's impossible to make any strategic planning for economic development if you do not control the prices of basic commodities. Here it is right here. Price formation with this new currency should get rid of Western exchanges of commodities. So what they have been doing, JC, is draining the exchanges, using our stupidity of manipulation of these commodities by holding them down to make the system seem stronger than it is. They are using that suppression to bleed dry everything. Now, we talked a while ago, and for those who don't remember, and I don't know if I said it on your channel or not, but the Chinese bought the LME, the London Metals Exchange. That's not the LBMA. The LME sells copper and zinc and lead and all of those things. And they're now warehousing the metal in China that it's being traded in London. So they're striking deals all around the world for soft commodities like wheat and soybeans and corn with Brazil and Russia. They are, and not the U.S. anymore, not settling in the U.S. They are gobbling up all of the gold and silver off of all the world's exchanges using the suppressed price, knowing that we suppress it. And that's how they are delivering it all and arbitraging everyone to buy here and deliver there. They bought the LME, so they're buying up all of the base metals and the copper that now, you know, Goldman Sachs says copper's on the run. Well, geez, I wonder why. And, and then, you know, they're striking deals all around the world in, in, in Africa and South America, building gold mines, oil refineries, roads, bridges, maritime channels, doing it cooperatively, where 36 other countries have formally applied to the BRICS. You're talking 80, 90% of human population when you add in the Belt Road Initiative, when you add in the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Eurasian Economic Union, and it's happening. So we've reached a escape velocity and the world yes. is here. Yeah. yeah. And if people weren't listening to me or you or others yeah. like us, they'd have no idea. And no. that's the scary thing. And this is really or watching the mainstream that, news did have no Yes. Yeah. No one gets it. Right. So, anyways, I think I think that that's a really, really important thing for people to understand about where the price is going and why it seems different this time, because they're they're not letting the price run away anymore. In fact, it almost seems like they're controlling it. Right. Uh, what was interesting, like when Lisa, hi, Lisa, uh, she says, yeah, uh, last week there, Zimbabwe hey, announced this new uh, gold back uh, dollar. Uh, and on top of that, also, China is putting up this new uh, blockchain 
uh, network here infrastructure yeah so we're getting into again here what you and i were calling years ago this multipolar world of yes currencies, and the systems are being set up the zimbabwe thing is interesting here because people are suggesting that it might be a test run here for something we might see in Latin America and then also here in North America. We're seeing uh, different states here uh, set up their own um, depositories and asking for their gold and silver back from New York, perhaps uh, in an attempt here uh, to enter this multipolar world. What do you make of this uh, Chinese announcement here, Andy, before we go too far? Yeah, um, I think it's a big deal. You know, we talked about, I've been, I mean, I noticed the Belt Road Initiative in 2020, and the thing that really stuck out to me about the Belt Road Initiative, look, for those who should know by now but don't, it's the largest infrastructure project ever attempted in human history. It's China's way of connecting Asia and Africa, South America, parts of Europe, bridges, roads, maritime channels. It will only be patrolled by military and commerce. No no one's taking a convertible cruise down the Belt Road. It, it's military and commerce. It's 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 pathways and shipping lanes and all of this stuff that is is part of the and it connects hand in hand with the bricks and and most of these pathways that are being built like the north south corridor there there's no interference by the u.s navy this is is a way for them to have their own infrastructure at and much quicker without going around the cape of good hope and all of these things that other people would have to do they can go right you know a pathway that goes from from uh, uh Russia to to India and and you know without going around and and all of these things well anyways the bottom line is it's growing it's 75 percent of human population right now 50 percent of global GDP and we remember in 2023 at the end that we saw the first ever cross-border digital settlement for gold using the digital yuan so and that was the the project Embridge so what right. this is it's called the 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 um, complex but, network let me go back. yeah it's a complex yeah. network but it's the, it's called the ultra large scale blockchain infrastructure platform platform for the belt road initiative the main focus of the project is to create a public blockchain infrastructure platform that will be able to support the implementation of cross-border cooperation projects along the belt road initiative in other words all of these countries 75 percent of human population will be able to trade with one another outside of swift and to trade even things like gold. Now, who are the ones buying all the gold? Oh, yeah, it's these people. Who are the ones that produce all the gold? Oh, yeah, it's those people. And and what is gold? Oh, yeah, it's the only other tier one asset. And what are these countries doing? That's right, they're dumping treasuries and buying gold and now trading it over a platform that sidesteps SWIFT. Do you see this happening and that's why I love that little by little by little, then bang, all at once, logarithmic decay. It's happening everywhere. Wherever you look at it in terms of what's happening to our country and the and the denigration of the of our society and our culture, or here in the growing um, sophistication and, and critical mass of, of, of this union and the Belt Road Initiative and the BRICS are like a brother and sister. They are tied together at the hip. Uh, and and as is the Eurasian Economic Union and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is the largest regional financial and military group in the world. These people need to be taken seriously. And the reason that you get all these guys that poo-poo some of this stuff that I say, there are a few. Number one, the bond market. Screw the bond market. The bond market is, is being seen for what it is by the rest of the world, and that is a tool of, of, of suppression or a tool of coercion or sanctioning, a tool of, of, of weaponization. And it's yeah. a tool that has not done well lately. And it is a tool that ultimately will be monetized by the Federal Reserve because the rest, and that's hyperinflation, folks, where they create money to buy bonds to finance the government. By the way, they're losing money for the first time in 100 plus years, lots of it. And all of the money that the Fed would make, they would give the excess to the Treasury so the treasury would have operational capital. Now they're getting none of it. So they have to issue more bonds to keep the engine running because we're addicted to spending at a billion dollar, or trillion dollars every quarter. So instead, they're going to have to issue more bonds. Well, who the hell is going to buy our bonds when we have chosen inflation over austerity, when our bond market has been ridiculously volatile, more volatile than gold for the first time in 45 years, when, when we can weaponize and take your money and your Forex reserves and your bonds if you piss us off. So they're not. So and on top of that, you, you're just giving three examples of why not to. But on top of that, now they have other options. Yeah, the options are growing by the day. Keep yes. going. Keep at the door. <laughs> Keep going. Yes. So you go get your package, and and that's the point, y'all. Is that 
Little by little, these people are, are building an infrastructure that will be impossible to back away from. 36 more countries have applied. And the reason these people poo-poo it is, well, the bond market, it's the most liquid. Well, they don't need the bond market. They'll use gold instead. And then they, they, you know, they'll say, well, who trusts, who will trust China? Well, who the hell trusts us anymore, right? And why would they? So that's where blockchain technology and gold come into place. It removes the need to be trust, to trust a government. And, and that's why Zoltan Pozar talks about this being the era of commodities and transparency, not opaque debt instruments where, you know, if I had to guess, they're rehypothecating the crap out of the treasuries too. Everyone, you know, it's not like they're bearer bonds anymore. So they're probably rehypothecating those as well. And now in a desperate attempt to sell more bonds, they're trying to remove the, let me actually find the article here. They're trying to remove bonds from the leverage ratio that banks have to have in store. How did that work out recently for the banks who had loaded up on treasuries? Uh, so you have the International Swaps and Derivatives Association uh, has written to the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve and the FDIC and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency and the Federal Reserve to urge the agencies to implement targeted reforms on the supplementary leverage ratio. In essence, what they're trying to do is have the exclusion of treasuries off the balance sheets of the banks so that they can load up on them and, and it's not even, it's not, part of the leverage ratio because they're absolutely riskless. And this, this, they say this reform is seen as crucial to preserve the resilience of the U.S. Treasury markets, the U.S. economy, and the international financial system at large. Bullshit. And you can see what the bonds really are. The world is seeing them for what they are. So now they're saying, fuck, what do we do? Well, let's tell the, let's, let's see if we can pass a law that says the banks can load up on those treasuries and they're not even on their balance sheet anymore. How did that work for silicone and signature? Anyone have any ideas on that? Or the other banks that are failed or the other banks that are on the razor's edge? Or how about the insurance companies that are loaded with 90% treasuries? Hmm. The point of it is, is that this is a, last gasp of a dying empire and i freaking hate to say these things because i love my country but it ain't the country i remember and if you don't see what's coming you're gonna get run over by it the rest of the world does our media doesn't jean claude god bless him and other people out there who have the courage to say these things mm -hmm. and i'll raise my hand there too because you know i don't hear a lot of people saying this kind of stuff um wake up y'all and it's getting it's getting close it's getting time <laughs> it should go down somebody was saying earlier in the show um let's look at let's stay in the, here in north america for a second here i brought this up in the next several weeks we could see 300 billion of liquidity leaving the system here of course if the fed doesn't step in uh, they were referring to of course the uh, volatility index on top of that you sent me this uh, that was interesting uh, okay there's a big number here added to the U.S. Uh, U uh, united states national debt here just in the last uh, 20 days and adding insult to injury there too, Jamie Dimon was saying, I think two, three days ago, um, that he sees the S&P probably dropping by 20%. So going back to this lack of liquidity or the liquidity getting out of the system here, if the Fed doesn't intervene, do you see a 20%? Do you see a 30, 40? Uh, I was talking to um, uh, Marty Hibbs the other day and he said, oh, maybe actually 50%. Like, we don't know. Like uh, when this starts going down, like it's like catching a falling knife here. We're, like the writing's on the wall at every level. Andy, tie these two together for us. Yeah, I mean, I think the Fed realizes that they kind of screwed up. Uh, I, I think they realize they screwed up and bonds are starting to crash and they're starting to crash because, well, no one's buying them. So yeah. that means the bond prices go down and interest rates go up. But I think the Fed, and, and in terms of how all this liquidity could just go to money heaven, is that they understand the, the position they put the stock market in by allowing it to rise almost parabolically, um, by allowing this to happen, by um, keeping rates where they were and making money easy. They There has to be... Uh, I don't know if you want to call it an intervention, but I think the bottom line is the, the sell-off is inevitable. The sell-off is coming as rates continue to rise. If rates rise and as they, you know, as you saw, they, you know, inflation is hotter than it is, they're not going to cut. And, and if indeed they actually go higher driven by the market, well, what it basically means is rising rates right now, um, you know, is actually bullish for gold because it, it to me, what it signals is that, and normally rising rates is bad for gold because it signals no one's buying the bond. So it means the Fed's going to have to come in and monetize, which leads to hyperinflation. But 
they're not going to lower. So as rates creep higher and higher and higher, as inflation gets higher and higher and higher, you're going to look at a massive sell-off. It has to, uh, both in the bond market and in the stock market. And I, I think when you talk about the um, uh, parabolic highs that we have uh, that have been held up by a handful of stocks, that is as dangerous of a market as you could ever be in. And if any of you are in NVIDIA and, and have huge profits in the market, what the hell are you doing, man? Profit's not a four-letter word. Take some of that profit. Get on the yeah. sideline. Don't yeah. be a, 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 a don't be a hog. They get slaughtered. Pigs get fat, and yeah. um, and that's yeah. what I would say on that. Yeah. Um, okay. So it appears we're at the end of the road. You said here the Fed is making a mistake. I think everybody's realizing that around the world. We're seeing it here with the de-dollarization, and now we're seeing Andy. And this is to me, this is frightening. But it looks like a trial balloon. Um, we didn't talk about this before the show, but uh, this is Christia Freeland, our deputy prime minister in Canada. Um, our finance minister is signaling here the desire for Canada's pension funds to invest more at home. This is, uh, in part here, a lobbying uh, push by the CEOs here in Canada, a group of CEOs, and many of them. And so now they're suggesting, well, we're running out of money. Why don't we use people's pension plans to reinvest in the economy? That's not going to end well, Andy. <laughs> it's like giving them, it's like lending money to somebody who's already insolvent and they're suggesting that the lender here should be the pensioners. Andy, come on. Well, man. I mean, I, that, that's, you know, desperate governments do desperate things. And yeah. where do you get the money when you need it? Yeah. Uh, somewhat related to that um, was in 2009 after the 2008 great financial crisis. Um, and what we saw was, you know, the money markets starting to go upside down because Lehman Brothers was running a lot of the money markets. And, and when they failed, people tried to yank their money out. It's called breaking the buck. And all of this stuff started to happen. And we were at the razor's edge. You know, you, that's when they had to bail out AIG. They were staring into the abyss, blah, blah, blah. There was a bill that was issued that made it down to the House floor and it was vetoed. Now, I will admit I was wrong in what I'm about to tell you, but I never lost a minute's sleep. And this is something that that I've always been okay with, taking accountability for my own actions. And um, I, I don't care what people tell me. I do what I think is right. And if I'm right, it's a lot nicer to know that I was right based upon my gut. And if I was wrong, it's easier to be wrong knowing some idiot didn't tell me to do something that I knew better. So anyways, I was wrong, maybe in retrospect. But anyways, in 2009, the bill came out. And it said, um, we if this happens again, that if things get tough, we will take all IRAs in the United States. At the time, it shows you how fast our debt has grown. This is 09. There was a $17 trillion debt, which is now 34. It's doubled since 09. But there was $17 trillion in, in US IRA money. And the idea was to take that money and and demand that it be converted into like an annuity of sorts, all backed by U.S. Treasuries in order to stabilize the system. And it would be guaranteed return by the U.S. government. Who knows what the value of the currency would be worth? But it was vetoed. It never made it past a bill. But the point is, the genie came out of the bottle. And, and just the other day in, I believe, Sweden, you have the Swiss uh, or the Swedish National Bank coming to the country and to the government saying, you got to give us you know, billions and billions of kroners or whatever they are, uh, because just to make us solvent again, you're going to see moves of desperation. Mm -hmm. And and that's, that's, you know, part and parcel for countries that make stupid decisions like Canada, like the US. And uh, I think you can expect to see more of that because at some point, where does the money come from? Higher taxes, higher inflation, where well, you can only tax and inflate so much so I got an idea. Let's go to the pensions. That's a great idea. And then we can take the retirement accounts and, you know, it, it, don't think that these things are immune to that type of uh, narrative. It's probably why, and it's funny too, because the mainstream news here in Canada, they're maligning uh, the Alberta premier who um, is wanting to leave the Canadian pension fund and manage it their own because they're saying, hey, you guys are bad managers. Uh, we want to protect our own Albertans here. But yet in the mainstream news, we're told that this is absolutely a stupid move. In my mind, I'm not sure it's stupid. I, I think it might be brilliant, but I think the mainstream media is really uh, angry about this being the you know uh, third party arm um, enforcing the narrative of the government because maybe those pension funds are not exactly what 
they used to be. And it, there were rumors back in 2008, 2009, after the financial crisis, that perhaps some of it had been used to shore up some of our uh, liquidity issues here at the banking level. Minister Flaherty at the time had called it a backstop. We used a different narrative here in Canada than the States. In the States, you had called it bailouts. Uh, here, they were called backstops, but their Canadian banking system was strong, we were told. Uh, so this is saying, hey, is the money still really there? At least the Alberta uh, government push is, uh, is stressing here on the government for this narrative. So it'll be interesting to see where they go with this, whether or not this move by the government to maybe use some pension funds to lock it up in investment so that the other provinces cannot take it out. Maybe that's the tip for that we're seeing here. But anyways, these guys are fighting with your money. And that's well, and they often find that the people running the pensions have uh, very unrealistic expectations of mm -hmm. what the returns will be. So yeah, yeah you know, it, it's no different than a Ponzi scheme where they say, I'll, I can get that. I can fix this or a guy that, that steals money and then goes to the casino to double up and put the money back. We'll get, we'll put it back. Or the guy that bets, you know, football games and, and gets smoked. And then it's like, I, I I'll double up this time. I'll get it back. I'll get it back. And yeah, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me and shouldn't surprise anyone. And, and this is why, you know, Bix Weir is right to a, to a degree when he says assets need to be in your, in your possession that that yeah. you know assets that have no counterparty risk in this environment you know a lot of what we're saying here is counterparty risk there is counterparty risk and having whether it be cryptocurrencies or or physical precious metals in your own possession it, it removes all counterparty risk and it's nice to have an asset that is simultaneously not someone else's liability it's really well, really, these really times when, when the trust is broken, uh, he's absolutely right. Exactly. And we're seeing these governments falter and falter and falter over and over again here. And the trust is absolutely broken. Uh, speaking of Bix Weir, uh, guys, I'm going to have Bix Weir and David Morgan, the silver guru himself here, at 3 p.m. today for this special uh, silver unobtainium show. So we're going to be looking at supply, demand. We're going to look at... Uh, some new stuff as well. So if you want to be on there, we have a great slide deck. You know, those are two of my favorite guys. Uh, I'll, I just want to give a shout out to David Morgan for people who don't know. Um, David Morgan called me 20 years ago and he said, my name is John Smith and I want to buy a hundred ounce silver bar. And the time silver was four or five bucks an ounce. Maybe it's 25 years ago. I don't know, maybe about. And, and I said, okay, John. And, and we talked for an hour. And he called me back a few hours later or a few days later, a few, maybe a week later, two weeks later. And he said, uh, this is John Smith. Hey, John. No, really. My name's David Morgan. I'm like, shut up. I know who you are. You're really David Morgan. Yeah. I mean, and he said, I did a test. I did a, uh, I did a test. I called 12 companies and you've won my test. Um, most of the companies wouldn't do the sale with me because it was too small, only 600 bucks, but you talked to me for 45 minutes and you delivered and it was perfect. And I'm going to promote you. And I, for a long time was on you know, he would send business to me. I was on his website. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went and met him in Vegas and asked him if he would um, speak with me around the country um, at conferences. And he'd talk silver, I'd talk everything else. And I was just some young punk. And he said, sure. And I traveled around the country with him for two years or longer speaking at seminars. I will never forget that. Uh, I have subsequently mentored some people that he mentored. I, I took him over, a guy named Maurice Jackson, who now works for me, because David taught me how important it is to pay it forward and to be kind. And David, I love you like a brother, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You gave me a start when you didn't have to. And uh, and Bix, well, you know how, how much I appreciate Bix. So for yeah. those of you wondering if you should watch that next show, they're two of the best, most genuine dudes I've ever met in this industry. And Great appreciation to them both. So just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> Thanks for that. I appreciate that, Andy. So yeah, guys, uh, join us at 3 p.m. This is going to be live here on YouTube and also uh, on Rumble. Uh, let's go back before we finish on this uh, gold to silver ratio thing. So people are saying, of course, uh, in the cup and handle formation that we're seeming at the breakout. People are arguing that no, really the breakout is probably going to start at 30. That's the resistance a level here uh, where the gold and silver uh, uh, ratio breakdown will occur. Either way, uh, whether you look at this or the cup and handle formation, I'll bring that chart up on, on the screen. 
are we getting closer to those dollar a day moves? Like it appears right now, there's a lot of pressure on the system. We're seeing some little pullbacks met right away with new volume. So they're, you know, we're not going back down. People are thinking at 26, oh, we'll go back down to 25. Don't worry, JC. And then at 27, no, don't worry, tomorrow we'll go back down. We didn't. We're standing here at 28 uh, right now. Let me see if I can bring up the silver uh, chart. Well, 28 on the dot right now. Yeah. So what do you make of that gold to silver ratio? Or is that signaling perhaps a bigger bull run than just a cup and handle? Is it talking about the same thing? Like, where's that in your head? Andy? Well, I mean, I think it just signals how undervalued silver really is in relation to gold. Uh, and we and you talk about a dollar move on um, Sunday night, Monday morning. Um, silver opened up 7% mm -hmm. limit stop in China. So it opened up over two bucks higher and triggered stop. Um, yeah. and if you look at what happened in, in the price, like, um, if you go back and look at the price, they smash a shit out of it before it opened mm -hmm. and it, 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 well, right when it opened, see, I don't know how it correlated there, but when it opened in the West or when it opened, it would have been in China. I don't know how, maybe it was London. Anyways, on Sunday night, when I looked at it, right when it's opening at six o'clock Eastern, it was down 50 cents immediately. And within 10 minutes, it was up 50 cents. Mm -hmm. So there was your dollar move in just a few seconds um, from down 50 to up 50. And gold was down 20 to up 20. Silver opened up in China Monday morning, up 7% triggered the limit stops. So yes, we are. But you know they're taking every, they're not letting this go easily. And, and I mentioned this on a few shows I did. Um, some idiot on a Friday, Okay, now think of how silver was up 50 cents on Monday morning. Some idiot on Friday or entity or entities um, continues to short SLV, naked short an ETF. Now go figure that. And on Friday, this entity shorted 12,599,986 shares. That's $288 million in one day. And with silver, what's silver doing today? I don't know if it's up. It is. Um, might be down and it's down 17 cents. So there's yeah. some pressure. There's some shorting pressure, yeah. profit taking pressure, but you know, yeah, I think that silver is the most undervalued asset on the planet. When you talk about its average ratio, the last 150 years, it's roughly 42 to one. If you go to gold silver ratio, hundred years and Google, you'll, you'll see a chart. You put a piece of paper at halfway on either side. You'll see for the last hundred years, it's about 42 to one. Even though for 5,000 years it came out of the ground at 16 to 1, and now it's coming out of the ground at 7 to 1. So it's yeah. coming out of the ground at 7 to 1, priced at roughly 85 to 1. Its average price, roughly 42 to 1. Um, you know, it's way out of whack. It's four feet of snow in the Florida Keys in August. It's not normal to see a ratio. It's yeah. less than one half of 1% of the time of the last 100 years we've seen it here. Yeah. It's an anomaly. Yeah. You know, I was having this conversation with somebody the other day about all-time high. We're there in gold. We're not there in silver yet. And people were throwing around this $50 number. And I found this like, oh, wait, wait, wait. The all-time high is not $50. It's actually 806. <laughs> if you look at it uh, um, in perspective here with inflation. so I thought Inflation adjusted, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and, and even if you didn't use the inflation adjusted and you just took the spot price of 23 60 2335 divided by 42. Well, that's what it should be right now, just based upon the 100 years of, of ratio. Right. But if you take 23 divided by seven, that's the mining ratio right now, based upon the, the, the Western price. If you told me tomorrow morning silver was 333 bucks, yeah, I'd believe it. And, and, and this is kind of, I think, why you got guys like Cliff saying it could go to 600. It could. Yeah. Because gold should be a lot higher. Silver should be a lot higher. And just looking at the relationship historically, geologically, intuitively, mathematically, economically, the whole nine yards. Yeah. I mean, to say those kind of numbers, people kind of be, yeah, right. It'll never happen. But it's $333 would be logical right now based mm -hmm. upon the, 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 the ratio of which it is coming out of the ground at. So sky is yeah. the limit. But and that's not accounting for money printing, debt deficit. None of it. No, no, no. <laughs> exactly. None of it. That's absolutely crazy, Andy. Hey, man, before we go, we're 45 minutes in. Uh, let's yeah, talk to the audience here about these cool new offerings that you have here. Actually, that one is a little bit – I uh, we still have those. We still have those. 
but I think we're also doing the 2024 Silver Eagles at 550 over spot, okay. which would be as good as anywhere in the country or pretty damn close to it. Um, but we do have those. And, and you know, the palladium bars, you know, palladium is, is a very interesting metal to me. It's an investment, a small one. Mm -hmm. um the the gold coins the pre-33 gold coins i love if i had my choice that's all i would own and if mm -hmm. you want the greatest form of utility uh and versatility with your silver holdings it would be in the in the pre-65 junk silver so but we also have the silver eagles 2024 and as bix will tell you they haven't hardly made any since march are we heading back up to higher premiums i know some of the most competitive online companies in america are that if you buy 1500 or over six bucks 625 or more some are even yeah. higher than that at 550 over spot uh it's as good of a price as you'll find anywhere this one here this uh, bag of the uh the junk silver is that just dimes and quarters i see there or yeah half dollars money? cost more money yeah. um there because they you know they're just a little more scarce but right, dimes right, right. and quarters yeah and usually when we sell That's a right. bag and a bag you can say i want 100 face 200 255 whatever face you want We'll right. do solid, solid bags of either dimes and or quarters. Okay. Okay. And you're good on the inventory right now for this? Right the... now we are. And that's one of the craziest things about yeah. everything is that as the price goes higher, uh, it's in the face not only of positive real yields increasing, a strong dollar, all of this stuff, but but also the lack of, of public participation. In fact, a lot of selling into the rise of gold and silver we've seen. And people really not taking part in this country the way they should. They're focused on NVIDIA and Bitcoin and not noticing this. And so the premiums, when you realize the first quarter of the year always means that the dealers like myself who have obligations with the Royal Canadian Mint, the Australian Mint, uh, the South African Mint, the UK Mint, uh, the Austrian Mint, and the US Mint as an authorized reseller, we spend millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars that we promise that we'll take. So you take all of that inventory in and then but go back to November, December. Since then, it was really quiet. So you, you're, you're choking on inventory from the end of the year, and then you have to take this stuff, not to mention deals you make with you know private refineries that make rounds. You have to take it. You buy it often months in advance, and so dealers are loaded with product at a time when the biggest money in the world, who's not only the wealthiest, but the most informed, is are, is using suppression to literally empty the shelves across the LBMA and the COMEX. And the public, as normal, is doing the opposite of what they should be doing. And mm -hmm. the premiums are lower than I've ever seen them in my career, with the exception of Silver Eagles, where they're starting to turn up again. And is that a precursor? Maybe. I guess we'll see. But uh, I, if I had my choice, that's what I would buy. It would be Silver and Gold Eagles or the pre-33 gold coins, if you can get them at anywhere near Gold Eagle, which you can, something to think about. For sure. Uh, guys, if you're on the uh, Canadian side of the border and you're looking for the specials here, you can go to mfbullion.ca. Here we have the 10-ounce uh, silver bars on special here at $2.99 over spot uh, Canadian. So this you'll pay in Canadian, shipped here in Canada uh, directly to your house here from mfbullion.ca. Andy, um, as we track into uh, the end of this week, looking into next week, is there anything on your radar here that you're looking at as perhaps a black swan event, something like that you're nervous about, that you're really paying attention to that could change markets here in a drastic way? If so, what would that be? You know, I mean, I'm looking for black swans all over the place. Uh, I I have a hard time believing with the big BRICS meeting in October, with 200 meetings leading up to it, with the election in November. Um, I have a hard time believing that, you know, look, let me just put it to you this way. 12 million people entered this country illegally. You saw there was a guy just arrested in Idaho, I think it was, or Oregon or Idaho. He was going to blow up a church, and he's conspiracy with Cons uh, he was doing cons conspiring with ISIS. Um, if if one tenth of one percent, one tenth of one percent of those people have bad intentions, that's twelve thousand people. How about two percent? That's two hundred forty thousand people. That's an army. How about five mm -hmm. percent? Yeah, you know, you're talking six hundred thousand people. And and I hate to be that way. I hate to say these things, but you see these idiots in Michigan. I mean, they can kiss my ass who are saying death to America, death to, get the F out, man. It's yeah. like, but we allow this to go on, right? And um, they would censor you for saying, you know, COVID or, or, or Hunter Biden a few years ago. 
Uh, but these guys can stand up and be broadcast on Fox News, death to America, death to America, death to America. If you don't think that a even one-tenth of one percent of the people who've, who entered this country have bad intent, then everything will be okay. To me, that's where the swan is, and it ain't a pretty black swan either, and I hope to God I'm wrong. I, I do, but, I mean, come on, use common sense. It just seems that's where we're headed, and then let's hope not, but... Um, Kind of seems where we're headed. Hope not for sure. I just saw the uh, trailer for the. I haven't seen the movie yet, but I've seen some of the decodes on this new Civil War movie. A lot of people are saying it's um, horrifying scenes in there uh, as society breaks down. And you know, if you study monetary policy, we've seen these cycles time and time again when the money degrades to the point that we are now. Things like this can and and do happen in our history. We hope that it doesn't. Uh, I don't know if this movie is predictive programming of what's coming up. The web bot data is suggesting that there is going to be some turmoil around. So, um, of course, there is. No matter what, half the country is going to be furious yeah. in November if, God willing, we even get there. Yeah. No matter what, and they always talked about the radical right. I mean, the right is timid compared to the radical left, who uses any and every tool to even circumventing law uh to screw you and yeah. and harm i mean it's like you know th this whole and that's that's the what's the first page of the communist manifesto divide and conquer we are divided more so than we've ever been yeah. you know or black and white red and blue vax no vax uh, you're divine by who you voted for in the last election and yeah. i mean everyone is at each other's throat and i'll tell you something i hope i hope trump wins because he'll slow down the 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 acceleration of of our demise i don't even know if anyone can stop it anymore we are so far down the rabbit hole but no matter what you're gonna have half the country furious pissed off and angry and to talk about secession to talk about uh, a civil war in some form of a context people would have thought that's just insanity but is it I don't it's think not, Andy. The RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police here in Canada, and the secret memo to the government here is saying that Canadians may revolt here once they realize how broke they are. They're, and most of the report is redacted, but from the stuff that you can actually read, they're expecting some weird stuff here, similar to what we're seeing in Europe right now with the farmers, uh, but perhaps even worse. And the web bot data is also picking up on this stuff here too. So no, it's not conspiracy. JC, I got six bedrooms down here, brother. And and if you need to bail, I got a room for, for you and Sarah here in, in Southern Florida. So come on down. And I just might take you up on that, Andy. <laughs> All right, Andy, brother. I love you, man. Thank you so I much love for you. Being here. I love everyone else out there. I, I, I you know... I'm passionate because I care and I uh, want everyone to everyone to do well and stay well. So until next week, JC, you stay well, my friend. Everyone else, God bless. Look forward to catching up next time. See you guys at 3 p.m. Eastern, guys, with Andy. And Say hi to David and Vix for me. David please, Morgan. please, please. Say hi we'll, to those guys. Will do. Thank you, guys. Right. Have a great day. We'll see you later. Bye.